A young man, the age of about 13 years old, in the time of Imam Malik, when Imam Malik was in his middle ages, a young boy by the age of 13, his mother from Mecca, his mother said to him, my son, you are now well known. You have memorized the whole Quran and you have memorized Hadith and you have memorized poetry. I want to send you to Imam Malik to learn his adab, his character, before you learn his knowledge. So she got him ready and she wrote a letter to the Prince of Mecca, the governor of Mecca, who was, happened to be her cousin. She wrote a letter to him to send a letter to the governor of Medina to go with her son to Imam Malik basically to intercede for him to become his teacher. So this young boy took this letter from his mother and sent him off, young 13 year old going through the desert to Medina, seeking knowledge. He reached the governor of Medina and gave him the letter of the governor of Mecca. And the governor of Medina, his face changed. He started to sweat. The young boy looked at him and said, what's wrong? He said, Wallahi, if the governor of Mecca asked me to walk barefooted in the middle of the desert with nothing on my head, it would be easier than for me to go to Imam Malik's house. Because he had so much respect for him. So the boy innocently said to him, well, you don't have to go to him, make him come to you. The governor of Medina laughed and he said, come on, let's go. So he went to Imam Malik's house. They knocked on the door and the housemaid, the servant of Imam Malik answered and they asked for Imam Malik. She said to him, listen, if there is a religious question, right now is not the time. Write it on a paper and he will answer it for you. If you want to learn hadith, go to his circles of daras, they'll be in a certain time. And if it's a government issue, this is not the time, there's another time for it. So the governor of Medina says, I have a letter for him from the prince of Mecca. So then the young boy says, a big, tall man, blonde, white, colored eyes, unexpected from the people of Medina came to the door. So as I looked up at him and the servant lady brought him a chair, he sat on it. And then he said, what does the governor of Mecca want from me? And the governor of Medina just gave him the paper without a word. When Imam Malik read this paper, he threw the paper away saying, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Has it come to this that knowledge now needs connections? He looked at the young boy and the young boy said to him, May Allah straighten the path of the shaykh. He said to him, I am from the lineage of the Prophet wasallam. So now, basically he forced, he obliged the Imam to listen to him. Ana Qurashi. I have memorized the Quran at the age of seven. And your muwatta, the whole of it, I've memorized it with this chain of narrations by the age of ten. My mother sent me here to learn from you. Imam Malik looked at him and said, O oh young boy, fear Allah and stay away from sins. If you do so, there will be something of your future if you apply these two advices. Does anyone know who the young boy was? He was Imam Muhammad Ibn Idris al-Shafi'i. Allah bears witness of greatness to himself that there is no God worthy of worship but him. And he bears witness to the greatness of his creation of the angels. And he bears witness to the importance and greatness of those in Jews and knowledge. He was born in 150 Hijri. And he died in 204 Hijri, so he lived about 54 years of age. He was born in the same year in which Imam Abu Hanifa died in. So he did not meet Imam Abu Hanifa. But he did meet every other Imam almost that we hear about, including some of the teachers of Imam Abu Hanifa. However, his main teacher was Imam Malik himself. He was born in Gaza and he was known as Al-Imam Al-Makki, the Imam of Mecca because his mother took him from Gaza when he was a child to Mecca and he traveled a lot and his knowledge different to the other Imams was almost in every area and every subject that you can know about. Imam Al-Shafi'i was what we say he was a Hashimi.
that he was from the bloodline of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam al-Shafi'i loved sports. He loved archery. That's a favorite sport. He was 10 out of 10 in archery. Excellent horse rider. And he would jump on his horse without needing to touch anything, maybe just the ears or the, the head. And he lived in the desert, it's very important, for 17 years of his life. When he was a child, his mother sent him to the desert for five years of his childhood, until he was 13 or 12. And then he spent another 12 years in the desert later on. Why? There was a, a, a tribe in the desert by the name of Banu Huzayl. When you hear this name Banu Huzayl, all the Arab world, especially in those times, knew that Banu Huzayl was where the original Arabic, the, the, the Arabic is to be taken from there. They were the spring, the fountain of all the Arabic of the world, Banu Huzayl. The turning point, just like I explained, that every Imam had a turning point where they went from one thing to another. Yes, his mother, she helped him to memorize the Qur'an and he memorized it by the age of seven. It is also said that he memorized al muwatta the book of Hadith of Imam Malik, by the age of 10 or 13 years of age. Like Abu Hanifa, he was inspired by another scholar. So there were two inspirations. We said his mother, but first he had an uncle who was a scholar. And in those days, they all learned this thing called farasa, alm al farasa. It's a science of looking at a person, and from their features, you are able to see signs of particular qualities in the person. So his uncle looked at his nephew, and at the age of about 10 or 11, he says to him, Son, I see brilliance and intelligence in you. He had a gift of memory. Now, all the ulama had this gift. But Imam al-Shafi'i, he was the pinnacle of this. He stood out in memory. As I said, he memorized the Qur'an at 7. He was a poet at 10, a reference poet at 10. He read the Qur'an every single day of his life. As for his features, Imam al-Shafi'i was Arab looking. Very healthy, had a strong build, tall, muscular. He had a strong presence. When he walked in, everybody stopped and listened and looked at him. He faced many trials in his life, especially with the government. He had an amazing character indeed. And he was, as I said, from among the three best generations after the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ said, the best of all generations are my generation. Then the ones who follow them after that, and the third best generation are the ones who follow them after that. His education and morals and etiquettes and character was exemplary. He accepted any advice from anybody. As soon as you gave him advice, if it had evidence and dalil, he'd listen to you until you finished. Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani says that Imam Shafi'i had 17 teachers in total in his life. Number one on the top was Imam Malik. He was his teacher until he died. His second teacher was Sufyan ibn Uyayna. And he was a student and a contemporary scholar with Imam Abu Hanifa. His third teacher worth mentioning is Muhammad ibn al-Hasan, who was the direct student and the best student of Imam Abu Hanifa. As for his indirect teachers, they were Imam al-Awza'i. Imam al-Awza'i had a madhab as well. However, his madhab didn't last long. What lasted from till today from his madhab is the area about international law. His indirect uh, alim was also uh, Imam al-Layth ibn Sa'ad. And he lived in Egypt. It was him that his students were, gave him a hard time. His favorite student went to Al-Yaman. And that's where Imam al-Shafi'i spent most of his time. He started his work in Al-Yaman and learned of this. When he learned of this student, Imam al-Shafi'i grew a great interest in, in Imam al-Layth ibn Sa'ad. He loved him a lot and he was very interested and he was actually influenced by his way after Imam Malik. Imam Layth disagreed with Imam Malik a lot and Imam Shafi was affected by that. He became a Mufti at the age of 20 years approximately. Imam Shafi was a genius, really. He had the utmost respect towards all of his teachers and people. He had an assertive nature. He pointed out errors in his teachers' opinions with respect and friendliness and mostly in his teacher Imam Malik. 
Now, Imam al-Shafi'i was the first to document his own madhab with his own hand. The other Imams, the students documented. He was the first to document it personally, summarized it in a book called Al-Um. And it, the, the book Al-Um contains opinions of Abu Hanifa's madhab and others. It contains ideas of Imam al-Awza'i, international law, and so on in Islam. But his greatest legacy was a smaller book by the name of Al-Risala. This is very renowned. The book of Risala is a simplified, has simplified principles, which all the madhabs agree on. They are the principles of fiqh, which makes Imam al-Shafi'i the first one to introduce this new approach called the principles of fiqh, usul al-fiqh. Every imam among the four imams and others had to face a clash with the government or a clash with the people. Because all of them were courageous. And as I said, they weren't government scholars. They weren't scholars of desire, scholars of wealth. They were scholars who knew that they were inheriting the legacy of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, with sincerity. In the time of Imam al-Shafi'i, something began to develop called Ahlul Ra'i and Ahlul Hadith. The people of opinions and the people of Hadith. Now by looking at it, you'd think, people of opinion, what's that? Chuck them aside. It meant that these were people who deduced new views about current situations based on Dalid, based on the Quran and Sunnah in all its ways. People of Hadith were more literalists. So for example, yani if you say, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used the miswak, they'd come up to you and say, you should never ever use toothpaste and toothbrush. Always the miswak, regardless, and die on that. Now what happened was these Ahlul Ra'i, people of opinions, they based on analogy, comparison, deduction, and they lived in Iraq mostly. Ahlul Hadith, their priority was to find the text and follow the text, literally, and they were mostly people of Hijaz. Hijaz meaning Medina, Mecca, those areas. Even till today, this is basically almost how it is. Both of them did not violate text, but one was more strict and, and literal than the other. What was the position of Imam al-Shafi'i? He was sort of half-half somewhere in between, a bit of a balanced approach. Not too much this way, not too much that way. But he also never violated hadith either. His statement was, all of us men of opinions can be disproved except for the owner of this grave. When he was doing his hajj, he looked at the grave of the Prophet ﷺ and he said, all of our ra'i, all of our opinions and views can be rejected and disproven except for the owner of this grave. And he pointed the grave of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When Imam al-Shafi went, he went to visit the grave of Imam Abu Hanifa and he made dua for him. He prayed in his masjid close to the grave where the grave of Abu Hanifa is. When he prayed, he used to lift his hands up after ruku' and when he goes into ruku'. But in the Abu Hanifa's madhab, it didn't reach him that this is part of the Salat. So he didn't raise his hands, that was his view. So Imam al-Shafi'i, for the first time there, they saw him not lifting his hands up in the Salat. So they asked him, why did you not follow the view which you know is, is right in your opinion? He said, because out of respect for the owner of this grave. And he pointed to Abu Hanifa. A Shafi'i's adab and respect in debating is also very renowned. For example, he never raised his voice in any debate. Number two, he stayed calm in every debate. He used to say that he never debated with anyone except that he first he made dua that the opponent, the person who's debating him is in the right and the right is with him. And he made a dua to help him. So imagine you're debating someone on a view and you've got different view and you're making dua that your brother who is debating you is on the right. And that Allah guides him. But the only thing is that they had a commitment to honesty. That was the only difference. Okay, I want you to be right, but I also have a commitment to honesty. And that's the deen. The deen is not yours or mine. He used to say, I never debated with anyone and liked him to make a mistake. He also said, give and take, listen and speak, and don't criticize the person personally. So there were no egos in all the differences of opinions. He used to say, throw away my opinion if it goes against the sunnah and take it as my madhab, for this is what we all want. He also had a sense of humor, Imam Shafi'i, an example of that is that 
he never used to stretch his legs out when people were sitting around him. He considered a lack of decency and courtesy for others to do something like that. But he also had a problem with his legs. Uh, he needed to stretch them. So he would uh, use humor to have an excuse to stretch his legs. One time he was sitting and his students were around him. And he asked the question. One student gave uh, an answer which was uh, way off track. So he said, well, since I have students like that, then I think there's nothing wrong with me stretching my leg. And he'd stretch his leg like that. His sources were the Qur'an, the Sunnah. And if he couldn't find the information in the Qur'an and Sunnah, he would use something called Ijma'. Ijma' means consensus. That when all the scholars or the Sahaba agree on something, he would take it. The, the fourth source which he used was something called Qiyas. Qiyas means to come up with a ruling based on analogy. Something that is like it. Further than that, he didn't go. He wrote 170 books, but the most monumental books were Kitab al-Um, made up of seven to eight volumes, and Al-Risala. Al-Risala is a very balanced book. It's got the fundamentals and principles of fiqh, which all scholars can use, and they don't differ with any madhab. My brothers and sisters, the scholars say that the book of Imam al-Shafi'i, Kitab al-Um, they said, you can see the spirit of Abu Hanifa throughout the book Al-Um. And he was the first, the one who stood out in saying, listen, he felt that people were following their imams too sh in a zealous approach, like they were prophets almost. So he wanted to break that trend a little bit to say, look, I'm even writing a book correcting some of the views of my own master. And he used to call him master, Imam Malik. To show you that there has to be respect but at the same time, a commitment to honesty. Because of that, the students of Imam Malik, after Imam Malik died, began to hate Imam Shafi. And some familiar scholars who followed the school of thought of Imam Shafi were Al-Bayhaqi, Al-Suyuti, Imam Al-Bukhari. They followed the madhab of Imam Shafi. Imam Shafi'i suffered two great trials. One of them was the trial of Khalq al-Qur'an. There was a people called the Mu'tazila, and they came with Greek philosophy thoughts. And these people said that the Qur'an is created, it's not actually the word of God directly. And one of them was Imam Shafi'i who had to say, face this trial. But the only thing is that Imam Shafi'i got out of it. And he said, the, the, the Zabur, the Injil, the Torah, and the Qur'an, these four are created. What he meant was, these four fingers are created. It didn't mean that the words of Allah are created. And they liked it. The government liked it and they said, okay, let all the Imams they say the same thing. But Imam Ahmad was the only one who stood firm on it. The second trial Imam uh, Shafi'i really went through, with, which Imam Ahmad didn't go to that extent, was a very sensitive political problem, which was the issue of Ahlul Bayt. In those days, there was no, no such thing as Shia yet. But there were some people developing from among the people who started to claim love for the family of the Prophet wasallam in a zealous way, in an extreme way. Whereupon they began to give them over praise. And then he started to enter into the political arena. There were two great empires, they were called Bani Abbas and Bani Umayyah. Bani Abbas were more linked to the Prophet's line from his uncle Abbas, and Bani Umayyah more from the Muawiyah side. But they were all cousins. They were all from Banu Hisham. But they had this uh, hate towards each other, and each one claimed that the Khilafah should be for them. Banu Abbas said, We're the ones, and we carry more of that bloodline. The other side of Umayyah, they said, no, we carry more of the bloodline. And then there was another group called the Alawites, not the Alawites of today, the Alawites as in the ones who carried the blood that went back to Ali radiallahu anhu. And these Alawites in those days were actually great people. We're talking about Zainul Abidin, the son of Ali radiallahu anhu, who existed at the time of Abu Hanifa. He went up against the government and Abu Hanifa supported him. In the time of Imam Shafi'i, this was developing. This was getting worse. This idea of Ahlul Bayt and the Khilafah should be for Ahlul Bayt. And the problems were, who are Ahlul Bayt? The Umayyads has taken over the Abbasids at that time. And the Abbasids claimed Khilafah. And they said, we've got to take it back. We, our bloodline is more important. Anyone revolting against the government about this, they were killed on the spot regardless of their status, even if they were Imam Shafi'i himself. 
until there came a Khalifa called Imam Harun al-Rashid. In his time, there was a ruler in Yemen. This ruler in Yemen did not like Imam al-Shafi'i because Imam al-Shafi'i used to, used to warn people and say the ruler of Yemen is an unjust ruler. Like all the other Imams, they did not fear for the sake of Allah. And he spoke about injustice. Since this idea of Ahl al-Bayt and who should be the Khalifa and so on and so forth was there, this ruler of Yemen had captured nine people who were talking against the government using the idea of Ahl al-Bayt. And he accused Imam al-Shafi'i to be one of them because Imam al-Shafi'i had close connections with them, students I think, or they attended their circle. All of these nine were beheaded on the spot. As for Imam al-Shafi'i, he was sent to Baghdad to Harun al-Rashid, the Khalifa. And there, Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, one of his old teachers, the student of Imam Abu Hanifa, who was the chief judge, he interceded for Imam al-Shafi'i in front of the Khalifa and said, he is not a foolish man who talks like this. Imam al-Shafi'i was innocent from all of this. He didn't revolt against the government. That's not the point. But he stood aground against the ruler of Yemen and said, if, it was, if I wanted to revolt, I would. But I don't see it the correct way. So he let him off and he said to the chief judge, look after him. But that's not where the most courageous point was Imam Shafi'i had to draw the line about this idea of Ahlul Bayt. Ahlul Bayt has nothing to do with the Shia. That's number one. And the Shia of today have <coughs> gone backwards saying the followers of the 12 Imams the, and they came to be later on. And these people started claiming that they love the 12 Imams more than anyone else in the world. But we love them and revere them. But the problem is that they say we love them more. To the point where we give them, they gave them powers and abilities that uh, really beyond measure. The debate was does it go all the way to Judgment Day? I mean, everyone who comes from the line of the Prophet are they considered Ahlul Bayt? I mean, today, in a sham in Egypt, there are more than 10 million people who claim to be descendants of the Prophet We have a problem here. And are they at the same caliber of all these Imams and all these Ahlul Bayt? Or are they not? The second thing is Ahlul Bayt is a part of our religion. We must love and revere the people of Ahlul Bayt. But the Shia today and the likes of them, similar to the statement, we're all equal, but we are more equal than others, in that sort of sense. Imam al-Shafi'i, what did he do? He created the dividing line, clearly, and courageously saying, the Deen and the Ahlul Bayt have nothing to do with the political makeup. Don't anyone come around and say that the Khalifa has to be from Ahlul Bayt and that the political movement and you fight over the bloodline and all that stuff. He said you have to, you have to separate between these two. And for this reason, uh, some people got jealous of Imam Shafi'i and they started claiming that he's a Shia later on in history and they said that he is a sympathizer of them and some of them said that he doesn't love Ahlul Bayt and all these people became jealous of him. They also accused Abu Hanifa and Malik as being Shia later on just because they studied under people of Ahlul Bayt. They studied under Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, revered and great Imam of Ahlul Sunnah. People like Muhammad al-Baqir, great Imam of Ahlul Sunnah. And these three Imams were students of them. Just because they're students of them doesn't make them Shia or anything like that. The second accusation that they made against Imam Shafi'i was that he was a worshipper of reasoning and philosophy. Again, only because he had studied under a great scholar who was an expert in Alm al Kalam, philosophy interpretation. Just because he studied under him does not make him like that. But he has nothing to do with either philosophy or Shia at all. Abu Hanifa considered that you know, different views to Imam al-Shafi'i. He considered that Bani Umayyah and Bani Abbas were illegitimate Khalifas. Imam Malik agreed but differed about 
some other aspects. Imam Shafi'i he said, the Khilafah, it is not a must for the Khalifa to be from the Prophet's family. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, people said, Ya Rasulullah, if you die, who becomes the Khalifa from your family? And he replied by saying, this matter, the Khilafah, Allah places whomever he finds, he wills to be in this place. So he didn't say it has to be from my bloodline. And the Quran states that royal blood comes through the boys. But Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had no boys. So then again, he used this as evidence. As I said before, the students of Imam Malik became extreme in their following of Imam Malik. And after he died, Imam Shafi'i found that people were saying, Qala Rasulullah. And the others would say, Qala Imam Malik. And he knows about the Prophet more than you. Even though something was clear. So Imam Shafi'i wanted to draw a line. Came up with the book and he wrote evidence against some of the errors of his teachers. Because of this, and because of all these different accusations, and because Imam Shafi'i became the top in the world in his time, Imam Malik's students, and this is a problem, they hated him a lot, and they waited for him when he was delivering a dars in the masjid in Yemen. They entered upon him, and after he finished his lesson, they attacked him. And they beat him until he became unconscious. He died a few days later. Now the scholars say he didn't die directly from the wounds. But he had another disease, another illness. That when he got beaten up, it exacerbated, he made it worse, and then he died. But as a result of that beating up by the students of his great Imam and great master. And here Imam Shafi'i, half of his reason for death was that he was beaten up by the students of Imam Malik. And if Imam Malik was alive, he would beat his own students up for doing that. Of these so-called students, sadly, who overpraised their Imams to the point where they made them almost like prophets. How dare you differ on my Imam's opinion? So my dear brothers and sisters, Imam Shafi'i died at the age of about 54 years of age in Yemen and uh, he was one of the great scholars of Islam. Today he's probably the second or third largest school of thought followed in the world. Imam Shafi'i's favorite student on the other hand was Imam Ahmed.